Thank you for joining us today for the National Drug Facts Week webinar, Replacing Myths with Facts, Ways of Informing and Engaging the Justice-Involved Youth. Um, this webinar is being presented by IRETA and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. My name is Chris, and I will now introduce Jim Aiello from the Institute for Research, Education, and Training in Addiction. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be with you uh, this afternoon to talk about an interesting, exciting topic, National Drug Facts Week, uh, with an emphasis on engaging justice-involved youth. Uh, later in the broadcast, we'll be joined by Brian Marquis, who's a public liaison officer within the Office of Science, Policy, and Communications for NIDA. Uh, and Brian was a key player with the launch of NIDA's National Drug Tax Week initiative four years ago. So we'll be really looking forward to hearing from Brian. And later still, Antoinette Thwaites, uh, uh, who is a forensic chemist and CEO and founder of the Association of Women in Forensic Science. And Brian will introduce her and tell you a little bit more about Antoinette uh, later on. So let's get started. Uh, our agenda today, when we did some introductions, we're going to talk a little bit about adolescent screening, uh, the, it's really the ESPERT model, the screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment model as it applies to adolescents. We'll also discuss drug facts and uh, juvenile justice involved youth, and uh, a special emphasis on National Drug Facts Week including some ideas about how you may be able to set up a National Drug Facts Week event uh, in your venue. And hopefully, we'll have time for questions and answers as we go along. A couple of commercials here that talk a little bit about the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which many of you are familiar with. It's a division of the National Institute of Health. Um, and uh, oops, the mission uh, is really to provide uh, support to people that are doing research across a, a broad range of disciplines around uh, drug abuse in this country. And the second part of the mission, which is certainly very important, is to ensure that there's a real dissemination of this information, the results of the research, so that, that we can improve our efforts at prevention and treatment, and even to inform policy as it relates to drug abuse and addiction. IRETA is a not-for-profit organization located in Pittsburgh. And the reason we're doing this together is that our missions are so similar. IRETA's mission really is to align addiction research and practice to improve outcomes for individuals, families, and communities. We are the home of the National Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment, uh, ESPERT, Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Uh, we also provide other kinds of training to interdisciplinary professionals, and we provide consultation for public and private entities on quality improvement and program evaluation. And so we've partnered today with IRETA, uh, I'm sorry, with NIDA uh, to present this webinar because we jointly recognize that juvenile justice, the juvenile justice population is a population that we really need to focus on. Uh, and as it says here, justice-involved youth are approximately three times more likely to have substance abuse problems than non-incarcerated youth. So that means they're a particular group that we should be interested in when we're talking about substance abuse-related issues and getting the facts to, to, those, uh, to those youth and also providing guidance as to how they might begin to change their lives. So we're going to start with a poll question. Okay. Um, we now have a poll question going. It's a simple yes or no. Uh, offer young people in our drugs. Uh, I will um, close this poll and we'll sh share the results. Okay. Uh, of the people attending, 71% um, do offer uh, young people information on drugs, and 29% do not. Okay. And we have another second question. Uh, if you do offer that information, do you feel qualified and confident when you offer it? Yes. And here's another yes, no, or somewhat. OK. I think that's a good representation. I'll share that with you now. 62% um, feel that they are um, qualified. Uh, nobody says no. And 38% say somewhat. 
So there is a need for more information out there. Okay, it sounds like we have a group that uh, mostly does offer information and is uh, relatively confident when they're offering that information. So, so much of what we discussed in today's webinar can, can bolster your confidence and, and hopefully help uh, others that are maybe struggling a little bit more to offer good, accurate information about drugs and drug abuse uh, to the, the folks that they deal with, give you a little bit more information that, that you might find useful in that process. We're actually going to begin, though, by talking a little bit about SBIRT itself, and that's screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, which was a protocol developed many years ago now by the World Health Organization in response to the fact that uh, in the earliest days that alcohol is such a contributor to health problems around the world globally and of course in our country as well as we know almost intuitively at this point both alcohol and drugs uh, certainly affect uh, the health of all age groups uh, in ways that, that can be very negative negative. and so SBIRT was developed as a way uh, to impact this fact. So uh, what is SBIRT anyway? Well basically SBIRT as SAMHSA uh, the, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration views it, is really a comprehensive public health initiative, uh, meaning that we're trying to get the idea that people would be regularly screened for their alcohol and drug involvement uh, in a way that will become almost routine and it will be a true public health initiative, uh, broadly based and broadly disseminated. And basically what SBIRT tries to do is to arrange for early intervention whenever possible for individuals who may be using alcohol or drugs in a hazardous way, which means they're using in a way that puts them at risk for, for negative consequences, and for people that are already using alcohol and drugs in a harmful way, meaning that they are already experiencing negative consequences because of their use, and even uh, identifying people who may have developed a serious substance abuse disorder and need treatment. So it's a response option that meets all kinds of uh, categories here. For one thing, it is primary prevention. If people are abstinent or use infrequently, it's an opportunity to encourage that pattern and to give out valuable information about what constitutes safe versus risky use of uh, alcohol and, and drugs. Uh, if somebody is using in a problematic fashion, then it's a time for a brief intervention, which is a structured counseling event based on a platform of something called motivational interviewing, where we try to engage uh, the people that we're talking to in their own reflection on what is involved in their use and how it could present problems to them, and would they consider making some changes, either cutting back or in some cases stopping use altogether. And then for people with the at the more uh, severe end of the spectrum, people who have dependence or, or, or a high level of abuse, it's an opportunity to refer people like that into specialty care so that they can get attention uh, to a problem which is serious in and of itself and serious uh, in relation to other aspects of their life as well, including their health and well-being. Now, in terms of ESPER for youth, in healthcare settings, it gets some pretty strong endorsements. The American Academy of Pediatrics uh, endorses ESPERT, uh, alcohol screening and counseling for all adolescents. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health uh, says that every adolescent should be asked yearly about their use of alcohol and drugs. So both of these organizations are urging us to engage adolescents in a conversation about their alcohol and drug use. And in the process, it gives us the opportunity to give them uh, important information about what constitutes risky alcohol and drug use. In terms of the juvenile justice system, I think this quote from Susan Broderick uh, at Georgetown University Center for Juvenile Justice Reform uh, is an enlightening one. She says, while sending young people to the juvenile justice system solely for the purpose of accessing treatment is not appropriate, when young people enter the system based on an offense, and a substance abuse problem is not addressed, it is a lost opportunity to affect the lives of these kids and their families in a positive way and to reduce reoffending as well. So you can see the advantages uh, of asking 
in doing the ESPER uh, model with uh, juvenile justice related youth. It gives us the opportunity to bring the subject up, to talk to them about it, and possibly have a really good impact on the way their lives are going to be moving forward and even reducing the possibility that they may, may reoffend in the future. So why do we use ESPER with adolescents at all? Well, for one thing, there's a large population of, of users, and this is true in the adult population as well, who use alcohol and other drugs uh, in ways that are really subclinical. In other words, they're not uh, addicts or they're not alcoholics, but they're using in ways that are risky. So we want to get at that population. Uh, we know that only a small percentage of people with clinical uh, alcohol and drug involvement get services at all. So even if people have more severe problems, they're really uh, an undertreated population in all age groups. Uh, and we know that the primary care settings, behavioral health, and other kinds of venues offer opportunistic settings uh, to, to bring up the subject. And these venues can include all kinds of places. They can include school health centers, college health centers, even faith-based organizations, and certainly even uh, criminal justice settings uh, that are interacting with the justice-involved youth. It expands service options, meaning that somebody may be coming in for some slightly different reason, but it's an opportunity to bring up uh, their substance use uh, and to examine whether it's causing difficulties in their lives. Uh, and there's a low threshold for service engagement often because people are coming anyway to these other settings. And so the fact that they're coming anyway gives us the opportunity to talk about their substance use. And in the end, it seems to work. Now, the, the, in terms of uh, research related to using ESPER with uh, teens, with adolescents, it has to be said that there is a, a small amount of research on the books right now, but there is growing literature that indicates that uh, teens uh, reduce their alcohol and drug use, uh, they reduce the consequences related to alcohol and other drug use, and it increases their self-esteem on some level as they begin to take more control of their lives uh, in, in the way they use substances. Uh, it, it increases their self-confidence, their self-efficacy. In point of fact, even though if we're dealing with any adolescent, abstinence needs to be the target because, after all, underage drinking is illegal and using illegal drugs is illegal, uh, nevertheless, abstinence isn't typical as we see across the spectrum with ESPER. But uh, people can make decisions about cutting back or even engaging in harm reduction activities uh, that would at least keep them safe uh, while they're using uh, and uh, give them the chance to, we, there used to be a saying, keep, keep them alive till they're 25, meaning uh, sometimes people kind of grow out of problematic alcohol and drug use as they get older, but in the meantime we want to keep them alive and so even uh, harm reduction activities can certainly be uh, recommended as part of the ESPERT model. Uh, the effects are rapid. People sometimes have a very quick response to the brief intervention. Uh, there seems to be a high satisfaction rating by teens themselves when they engage in the ESPERT process. And if they have a good experience with ESPERT or the ESPERT protocol, uh, it can promote additional help seeking, uh, which may be important for the future. Now, some of the components of, of, of the ESPER protocol for adolescents include screening. It may seem obvious to say this, but it's very important to ask. If we don't ask, they won't tell. Uh, so we really need to not be shy about introducing an alcohol screen, and we'll be talking about one, of, a valid screen, in a minute, which is very useful when dealing with adolescents. We want to make a good beginning, uh, engaging the, the, uh, the person, the young person in the process, uh, making sure that they feel comfortable and not threatened by the questions that we're going to be asking. Uh, we want to routinize it in some, in some ways. Part of the protocol encourages us to explore pros and cons, which means we, we should legitimately ask the adolescent, well, what is it that you like about drinking or using drugs? Because people do things because they like something about them even things that are harmful to them. So we want to give the adolescent a chance to talk about that and then to weigh against that what are the cons or the negative uh, consequences that have entered their lives because of their substance use. And when we present it this way, it becomes then a, uh, not a judgmental event but a discussion uh, which then can lead us to explore with them their readiness to change. 
and to design an intervention based on their readiness and not necessarily our panic about the situation. Um, and there are some steps that can be taken uh, even if people have a fairly low readiness to make major changes. Uh, of course, the, the idea would be to develop a change plan, something that the, uh, the uh, adolescent client can, can buy into, something that they're willing and able to do. Uh, and in, in the case of working with adolescents, it can sometimes be useful to offer incentives. If they have so many, if they come in and always have a clean urine, uh, maybe uh, you know some kind of an incentive, uh, uh, you know whether that be points that lead to some kind of prize at the end or other kinds of incentives that may encourage the young person to stay with their change plan, uh, and even encouragement to stay with the plan can be an incentive. Uh, and then we want to, uh, as part of the brief intervention, we want to uh, to have a good closing. Uh, where we summarize the plan, we may even write it down, we may even get the adolescent to sign the plan as kind of an agreement with themselves to make the kind of changes that they've agreed to make. And again, they don't have to be, uh, it would be great if they could be world changing and, and based on abstinence, but even if they make small steps in the direction of change, that can be important as well in the expert model. Now, the the one of the uh, valid screens that can be used with adolescents uh, is called the CRAFT. Uh, and we can see that the CRAFT is, is well researched. It's recommended by the National Institute of Health and the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Substance Abuse. Uh, and we can also note that it has been used in juvenile justice settings. So we'll just take a quick minute to take a look at the CRAFT. And, and you might want to be thinking yourselves uh, if you can use this uh, screen in, in, in your practice or in your setting or, and how you might use it. The craft really is kind of in two parts. Part A is, is, is really a pre-screen and you can see these questions uh, on the screen now. Obviously if the answers are no, no, and no, uh, you've done a pre-screen and somebody has screened negative uh, and they're not, uh, you know, there's no need for to proceed with the main body of the craft which is six more questions. Um, but it is useful in addition to these three questions about whether the young person drinks any alcohol, has smoked any marijuana or hashish or used anything else to get high. It is useful to throw into the pre-screen the first question on the craft itself and we'll take a look at that now. The C uh, on the craft is have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone including yourself who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs. Obviously the, this gets to a safety issue. Uh, if the person isn't using themselves and they answer yes to this, it gives you an opportunity to talk to them about the, the risk they're putting themselves uh, in if they do decide to get in a car with somebody who may be impaired. The R uh, has to do with uh, using alcohol and drugs to relax. Uh, the A, which is one that sometimes adolescents really respond to, do you ever use alcohol or drugs when you are alone? And they'll say, well, no, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't do that. I just do it with my friends. Although sometimes you may get a young person who does drink alone. Uh, the F, do you ever forget things while you're using alcohol or drugs? The other F, the second F, do your family or friends ever tell you you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? And the T is have you gotten into trouble while you were using alcohol or drugs? And of course some, uh, some of the young folks that are involved in the justice system uh, are going to score on the T for sure. So those, uh, those questions, those six questions, constitute a valid screen and they yield a score. Each yes answer gets a point of one and if you have a score of two or more, it does indicate risk, risk level. And it's useful in the ESPER protocol to give the person you're screening their score and then to explain to them what the score means and how it indicates the kind of risk that they may be involved in. And you can see from the questions themselves that there's also room in there after this, I, I would recommend after the screen is done to go back and talk about some of those individual uh, responses that they may have given you. So that's the craft. It is copywritten uh, and was developed by the Children's Hospital of Boston. Uh, but I should tell you that they that they're, would be happy to let you use it. Uh, I think their, their main concern and, and why it's good to check with them is to use it in the format in which it was developed. Like any valid screen, 
we need to use it in the format in which it was developed. And I think that's the main concern about the, uh, the, uh, the folks up at uh, CSER, the Center for a a Adolescent Substance Abuse Research at Children's Hospital in Boston, who developed this. And you can see their website there, www.caesar.org. Uh, that's their concern. But they're happy to have it being used, obviously. OK, so now there's another poll question. This question reads, is there a screening protocol for substance abuse or substance use disorders used among the youth that you work with currently? Of the people here today, 64% um, do have a, um, a screening protocol, and 36% no. So you've got about two-thirds yes and one-third no on that. Okay. Well, that's great. I'm glad to hear that so many are using a screening protocol. Uh, and I would encourage you to use a validated one. That, that, that can be quite useful. And for those of you that aren't, you may want to consider using the craft uh, or another uh, screen that you may, uh, may come upon. Uh, but make sure, if you can, that it's a valid screen, because I think that's the best way to proceed. OK, just a couple of online resources about SPERT. Uh, you can see our IRETA.org uh, website there. Our toolkit for SPERT is available to you, and lots of other good information about the use of screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment uh, as a model uh, is on our website. And we have an excellent webinar library. And right now, posted in the library is a really good um, webinar called Esper for Adolescents. It gives a lot of information you know, about adolescence itself, the adolescent brain, uh, and using Esper uh, you know, for adolescents. So with that, I think uh, I'm ready to turn it over to Brian at this point. OK, I'm here now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, youth is a, it's a critical time. The um, Monitoring the Future study is a, is a survey that we do with the uh, University of Michigan Institute for Social Science Research. And we have been doing it for the past uh, almost 40 years. And uh, in 2012, Approximately 45,000 students were surveyed, representing uh, 395 public and private schools on the attitudes and perceptions uh, of drug use. Some of the uh, survey re results, we have some good news first. And it uh, looks like the cigarette smoking continues to fall uh, to the lowest rate in survey history. And uh, five-year trends are show, showing significant decreases in alcohol use as well among all grades and across nearly all prevalence periods. The use of ecstasy showed a significant drop in the past year from uh, 2011 to 2012. And uh, overall, the, most, uh, the use of most illicit drugs has either declined or remained steady, steady from 2011 to uh, 2012. And, um, this year's results should be coming out in the next uh, few weeks. Um, the last two decades of alcohol, cigarette, and illicit drug use, you can take a look at this chart from 1992 to 2012 for alcohol, cigarettes, and illicit drug use. And uh, it's, it's astonishing to see that 41.5% uh, of 12th graders, 30-day um, use of using alcohol, uh, cigarettes, and and then uh, illicit drugs. This is pretty interesting over this uh, this time period, and um, I think it really does tell a tale about um, uh, this particular survey. So the bad news: uh, significant increases in marijuana use among 10th and 12th graders, uh, softening attitudes about the perceived risk of harm associated with marijuana use, and um, new synthetic marijuana use, also known as K2 or spice, among 8th and 10th graders. Uh, this is new in the survey uh, this past year. Also, bath salts uh, reported 0.8% of 8th graders, 0.6 10th graders, and 1.3% of 12th graders. And many of these drugs used by 12th graders are prescription or over-the-counter medications. So there, although there's a drop in non-medical use of Vicodin among all grades, its use does remain at unacceptably high levels. And um, the percentage of 12th graders reporting the non-medical use of Adderall has increased from 5.4% in 2009 to 7.6% in 2012. 
This is also a very interesting, uh, very interesting infographic. The marijuana use among 12th graders versus perceived risk. So as you can tell, as the perceived risk goes down, use goes up. And um, if you can imagine a classroom, 30, about 30 kids in a class, 11 students on average in class uh, that among 12th graders uh, smoking marijuana. Prescription over-the-counter versus illicit drugs. The uh, percentage of 12th graders have used these drugs in the past year. After marijuana, prescription over-the-counter medications account for most of the top drugs abused by 12th graders in the past year. So NIDA, we trusted source for information. Uh, we, uh, science of drug abuse and addiction include uh, nicotine addiction, prevention and treatment, illicit drugs and their medical consequences, as well as prescription drug abuse, and the link between drug abuse and HIV AIDS. Uh, like I said, the annual Monitoring the Future survey among 8th, 10th, and 12th graders for this year, 2013, we should have the results in the next couple of weeks. And um, NIDA is also your link to other relevant NIH institutes and government agencies that can help. And uh, this particular link here, the drugabuse.gov publications, uh, is, is a great a resource, and I encourage you to, to utilize that link uh, you know, in your work. NIDA's funded research in the juvenile justice system. Approximately half of all teens who enter the uh, juvenile justice system need treatment for substance use disorders. The remaining half would benefit from a drug abuse prevention intervention. In addition to funding uh, individual research products, NIDA, all's projects, all, NIDA also supports three major multi-site initiatives to address drug abuse in the criminal justice system. And the most recent initiative was launched in July of 2013, which is the Juvenile Justice Translational Research on Interventions for Adolescents in the Legal System, or JJ Trials. And this is a partnership between seven research centers which work together to determine how juvenile justice programs can effectively adopt uh, science-based prevention and treatment services for drug abuse and HIV. NIDA's other uh, justice system research initiatives, uh, the uh, CJDATS, uh, that was launched in 2002 to improve substance abuse and HIV treatment services in the criminal justice system, thereby improving public health and safety outcomes for those returning to the community. And uh, seek, test, treat, and retain addressing HIV in the criminal justice systems to develop, implement, and test strategies to increase HIV testing and improve continuity of heart upon re-entering the community. And you can also find out more about this uh, by going to our, our justice system page at drugabuse.gov. Our NIDA for Teens, through our NIDA for Teens website, uh, we're working to get these facts out about drug abuse on the brain and the body and behavior directly into the hands of teens so that we can shatter the myths and enable teens to make better decisions. A study released earlier this year showed that people who used marijuana heavily in their teens and continued through adulthood showed a significant drop in IQ between the ages of 13 and 38, an average of eight points for those who met criteria for marijuana dependence. So there are a lot of myths out there flying around about, uh, about drugs. Uh, prescription drugs are always safe because they're prescribed by doctors. Pot is not addictive. Drug addiction is a choice. And natural drugs are safer than synthetic ones. These are some of the myths that we're hearing from teens. National Drug Facts Week shatter the myths about drugs and drug abuse. So we're in our fourth year. And uh, National Drug Facts Week, we've been able to reach thousands of teens and tweens with scientific facts about drug abuse. Um, and with your help, we can even reach more. About National Drug Facts Week, National Drug Facts Week is a health observance week established in 2010 to shatter the myths about drugs and drug abuse through community-based events and activities. In 2014, it's going to take place uh, January 27th to February 2nd. And schools, community groups, uh, prevention coalitions, municipal governments can engage teens about science behind drug abuse by providing uh, scientific information uh, through NDFW materials and events. So PeerX, this is, um, this is an initiative that we uh, 
that we have. It's an interactive, uh, interactive site about prescription drug abuse, uh, stimulants, opioids, etc. And um, it's filled with uh, activity ideas, step-by-step -step instructions that teach that teaches the dangers about uh, prescription drug abuse. We have some great interactive videos on this site that allows viewers to assume the role of the main character and make decisions about whether or not um, their main character will abuse prescription drugs. We have uh, downloads uh, that share prescription drug abuse prevention messaging. Some of our uh, NDFW 2014 partners to date, as you can see, we have a wide array, wide array of, of terrific partners, including our, our federal partners. But the, some of these on our list are, are non-governmental organizations, such as American School Counselors. What we try to do is reach out to the uh, teen influencers and organizations that um, that we feel are uh, like-minded, share the same common goals uh, with um, our drug abuse messaging. So um, we, we ha actually have more partners than what you see here, but these are just a few that um, we wanted to highlight in our in our efforts. So planning now to, uh, for for drug National Drug Facts Week is. Um, is easy, and like I said, we we're in the midst of it, and um, we we're, we're in the process of planning, and we will uh, we'll be doing this until um, until uh, the date, and even after that. So, with that, what I'd like to do is introduce Antoinette Thwaites, who has been a uh, an advocate of of NIDA and National Drug Facts Week, and her efforts with the uh, Philadelphia Police Department as a forensic chemist as well as uh, her organization, the Association for Women in Forensics uh, in Philadelphia. So I would like to hand it off to um, Antoinette. And let me just say that she has been, like I said, a, a tremendous supporter and really knows the ins and outs of, of how to throw a great uh, National Drug Facts Week event. So Antoinette, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, the reason why I became interested in hosting the National Drug Facts Week is because I analyze uh, controlled substances for a living. So I come across a lot of these dangerous drugs that Brian just mentioned in his presentation. And um, I also wanted to be a, an advocate of making teens aware of what these drugs can do to them if they, if they try these things. So I hosted two events. The first event I hosted in 2010, I, I hosted it at a recreation center. And the next event I hosted in 2011 that was at a high school, and I hosted it on a Saturday. Um, I pretty much just reached out to a lot of the community groups. Um, any, uh, I, I worked alongside a coalition so that we can try to recruit some of the teenagers to come to the event. So the teens were from violence reduction programs as well as just teens that were never incarcerated before. I to promote the event, I, I made up a, a I drafted a partnership letter because that was the first thing I felt that I needed to do to actually make the, the local community aware of what we were going to do with organizing this event. And with the partnership letter, I did use the information from the um, National Drug Fact Week toolkit, the fact sheet that they have to to uh, give them um, information about what the event is and who the partners were with. Uh, with promoting the event. So I did email blast. Um, we, we made posters to, to post around, to post in the schools. Um, I also incorporated the publications that NIDA has in their toolkit, which is the Shatter. Um, let me look at this publication. The Drugs Shatter the Myths publication, which a lot of people enjoy that publication. And I also used the National Drug IQ Challenge. So um, the day of the event, we were very impressed with the turnout because it, it worked with us getting the teens there. But we wanted to make the event engaging to the teens. So we had guest speakers. Uh, we had breakout sessions. Um, the partners that came out to the event, they set up their information. They had tables set up to distribute to the teens. And it really turned into a mini health fair. Uh, we had a DJ there to play some music. Uh, we just wanted to make it informative, but as well as entertaining for the teens. And um, we also had 
a DJ play some of the music that influence uh, the promotion of drug abuse through certain euphemisms that they use in music. So we did shine some light on certain drug slang names that the teens were familiar with, with um, a lot of these, these drugs that we wanted to make them aware of. Um, also, it, it just was a collaborative effort. And in the second event, it worked in the same way. We had it on a Saturday because we wanted to be able to have more teams come out and not have to worry about uh, conflict from, from, with their classes and, and things of that nature. So, uh, and again, you, you can really plan a, a nice event with a shoestring budget, and that's, and that's what I did. Um, Brian Marquis was very helpful in getting the information that I needed. He always was checking on me every day, calling, emailing me. He sent me all of the publications. They were, they were free, so I, I, didn't, I had plenty of that to give away. He sent t-shirts, so that was one of the um, items that we gave during the giveaway. And when I gave away things, they were items that I didn't have to purchase. A lot of it, I, that was the purpose of me drafting a partnership letter was that they would sponsor by giving me something free I could give away and in return I would um, add their logo to our flyer because a lot of businesses like to see their logo on uh, marketing materials so that's that's what we did I just really I'm just really connected to the initiative again I do that I do this forensic drug analysis for a living I know how to communicate with the teenagers and if you really don't feel like you are able to communicate and you need some assistance then that's where the NIDA publications would, would come into play and I just felt that was a great opportunity for me to use the National Drugs Fix Weeks platform to tie into what I already do with my workshops with um, drug awareness and um, teaching them about forensic chemistry and the different types of drugs that we actually analyze in the field of forensic drug analysis. Um, so I, I believe that the, I would highly recommend that the first thing is just getting the word out there to the local community, sending out emails, um, flyers, um, getting the, the schools to get involved, um, and making it youth friendly and youth attractive so that they want to come to the event because you can have a great event but you want to have the teens come come to the event. And a lot of the the coalition was really helpful in getting a lot of the, the juvenile justice programs to bring a group of kids to the event. So there were different organizations that brought groups of kids with them. And that was also very helpful. Um, and I had I had some food there. They really liked that. And I I until this day I still use Shatter the mess publications in all of my in all of my classes because I got a lot of good feedback from um, the programs that wanted to know where they could get the publication and they thought that it was it wasn't free but I let them know that it, it was definitely free and they could order as many as they needed. Brian, is there anything I forgot? I don't. No, I mean I think that that was uh, that's really it in a nutshell. I mean I think you described mm -hmm. uh, excellent you know, the, the the you know the the whole rollout of, of how it is to, to plan an event. It can be as large or small as you want and uh, how to get partners involved and, and just different coalitions and really bringing the community in. Uh, that, was, that was terrific. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So now uh, we are going to uh, I'll give you a little bit more information on uh, on ways that uh, you can become involved with uh, with National Drug Facts Week. We have a step-by-step -step toolkit on our site, and um, there are six steps to hosting a NDFW event. One of the things that I would suggest is taking a look at drugfactsweek.drugabuse.gov and really taking a look at um, what some of these other groups are doing as well, what they've done in the past. Um, you know, a lot of them are school-based, these events, because they, we have a built-in audience uh, with the schools. They have a vested interest in, in, this, uh, in this material um, for their program. So uh, it's, it really is um, a, a, an interesting website. And um, over the course of the past few years, we've really refreshed it and uh, 
the toolkit really is uh, is key, I think, to uh, to planning a successful event. And like Antoinette said, the uh, the Shadow the Myths booklet is one of our signature publications and can be ordered uh, through the site there at drugfactsweek.drugabuse.gov. And um, I would highly encourage you to do that as well. One of the other days during the week, um, actually, this is this is really the way that Drug Facts Week actually started was um, our Drug Facts Chat Day. And because we had such a large uh, audience of teachers, we were able to tap these teachers um, through email and uh, sort of get their uh, feedback on ways that they would like to participate as far as an online chat with scientists in the classroom. And um, what we did was we uh, sent out emails letting folks know that we would be having an uh, online chat with the scientists back here at the Institute. And uh, it would be a, a 10 hour period during the day. Uh, and we, um, uh, we enlisted uh, schools from across the country, uh, approximately 120 schools per year. And um, chat day will take place this year. Uh, January 28th, and um, this is really a great opportunity for, for students to, to interact with the scientists and ask questions about whatever's on their mind. So um, like I said, we, uh, we're looking at about 100 schools, and uh, registration, uh, we were hoping it would go live on December 2nd. Now we're looking at December the 9th, and this registration actually fills up pretty quickly. And uh, so if it's something that you think you may be interested in, um, you know, keep, uh, keep that website handy, the drugfactsweek.drugabuse.gov, because this way at least you'll be able to, to know when we open up that chat. I don't see it opening um, until the 9th. We have free resources as well, and as you can tell by this, uh, uh, this slide here, the Drug Facts Shatter the Myths booklet. That is the booklet that... Uh, that Antoinette was referring to. It is a popular booklet, and um, we do send out hundreds of thousands of these booklets every year. Um, our National Drug IQ Challenge activity, this is also available in Spanish. Uh, we don't have hard copies if this. This is online, uh, online only. It can be printed off, though, as a PDF and used uh, for your events. This is also a terrific res resource that um, that uh, they use, that classrooms and students use uh, not just for Drug Facts Week, but throughout the year. We update it every year for the past four years. And we also uh, work with Scholastic and have created a terrific poster, Drugs in Your Body. It isn't pretty. There's a teaching guide on the back. And um, this really is um, a, a great new addition to the resources as well and our uh, signature publication, Drugs, Brains, and Behavior, the Science of Addiction Booklets. This is another uh, great complement to the other materials that I just mentioned. So preventing drug abuse is possible, and we can do this together. Uh, all we ask is that you um, take a look at our, our site, drugfactsweek.drugabuse.gov, and um, you know, to get more information and um, certainly appreciate any type of uh, any type of questions around Drug Facts Week. The uh, promotion we have some promotional videos on our on our site and um, through, actually on YouTube, and um, they uh, they can be viewed. Uh, it, it's sort of a step by step, easy way for you to to learn more about Drug Facts Week and. Um, how some of these um, events roll out, as well as our chat day. And uh, as far as more information about generating ideas for your events or get to get connected with uh, an expert or scientist, uh, you can email the, the drugfacts at nida.nih.gov with any questions that you may have. And uh, we're certainly look, looking forward to, um, to working with your groups and, uh, and planning uh, planning for for National Drug Facts Week. So, I thank you very much. Sorry about the technical glitch here, uh, but uh, if there's any questions that you have, I'm more than happy to to field them um, now at uh, at your convenience.
Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please type them in at this time. We'd like to have this as a discussion period before we, we close the webinar. So if you'd like to talk to um, Antoinette, Kim, or Brian, uh, please type those in right now or um, uh, put the hand sign up next to your name so I can see that you want to be unmuted. Well, I don't see any questions coming in. I will send everybody a um, an email tomorrow with uh, the uh, NADAC certificate and also links to the webinar and the slides. So at this time, I want to thank Jim, Antoinette, and Brian for uh, putting this webinar together and bringing it to us. And I also want to thank all the participants who attended. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and look forward to seeing your names on future webinars. Thank you very much.